Great. So we're on this journey called Building Strong Families, and we are approaching sensitive areas, and you've covered lots of ground. And, and if you've missed a lot of this teaching on building strong families, the, the Lord instructed me last year that the next stage of building in the earth will be a family that is mature. And I've been doing that laboriously and laboring with you through some difficult scripture, and you've been learning about God as Father and what that means. You've been learning about what it means to be a son and true sonship. And how we, when I get up here, I talk about how we live as a family. And since we have started this subject, it, <clears throat> I've done more family counseling than ever. <laughs> and I realize why. Because we are stirring things. We, we, we are touching areas that are uncomfortable. And we are waking things that have been buried but still alive. They, 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 you, things have been buried in your family and never dealt with. So by talking about some of these subjects, you, you, they awaken things in you and you realize, I've never dealt with those things. Or I've, I've never forgiven. Or why am I still feeling bitter and angry? And for some of you, I've encouraged you to stay in the service. And some of the workers in the church, those who are serving, I've said, please, can you release um, that person from this ministry or that ministry? Because I sense that it's important for them to be in the service. Um, to, you experience grace when the word is preached and ministered. And so as we, there, there are some that needs a specific measure of grace for the season. And for some of you, I've encouraged you, please stay in the service. Don't go and, minister, don't go and um, check on security or don't go and check the children's ministry. Don't go to the nursery. Don't go to the lounge. Stay here in the service because it's when you humble yourself and you rest in the Word of God, you receive the grace that's needed for your season. And some of you require a measure of grace, grace right now because you, the Lord is preparing you for great exploits in the world. Things that you are not yet aware of that will become very clear. There are things that some of you are going to do that's going to shake the foundations of darkness to the extent that you're going to need such a great measure of grace because it's grace that will sustain you. It's not your power, nor your might, nor your ability, nor your intellect, nor how much resources you have. It's grace that will sustain you. Some of you are going to do things, and, and it's not only... Um, strongly on my heart, but you've received prophetic word over the last few months. Some of you, the Lord is, is waking you up and He's speaking directly to you about certain things. So, you, you now, as you receive that prophetic word, you now need to receive the grace to activate what the Lord is speaking to you. Right? So, if you don't do it in grace, you're going to do it in your own strength. And it will lead to disgrace. <laughs> whatever you, you accomplish in your own flesh without grace will always lead to disgrace before the Father because it's not about Him then, it's about you. Right, so I'm going to read a passage of Scripture and allow me to start. Thank, thank you guys for, not, for coming down and not moving around upstairs. It, it gets a bit distracting, so um, this is a sensitive Pentecost message. Hallelujah! Um, so, would, would, you, would you like me to raise my voice a bit or um, get excited? Because this, it's Pentecost, and when the Spirit comes upon you, you speak in languages, um, that are not known to men, but needs interpretation, and it speaks. 
heavenly words that shapes things in the earth. So, passage of scripture is in the book of Ephesians, if you can go there, and Ephesians chapter 3. And we have the first introduction to Ephesians chapter 3. We're talking the mystery that is being concealed is now revealed in Ephesians. And that mystery is you, the church. There was a mystery that was, was concealed to Moses, a mystery that was concealed through the ages, a mystery that David never knew about. A mystery that Isaiah could only allude to in prophetic voicing. But that mystery is now made known and that mystery is now, the curtain is drawn back in Ephesians and Ephesians chapter 3 says that mystery is the church. And isn't that exciting? I know some women are thinking my husband's still a mystery. Um, but we are a mystery a mystery that is now made known to every power and principality. The mystery that was concealed through history is now revealed, and you are that mystery. I, it, I mean, so, and, and we're going to pick up from there, because verse 14 says, For this reason, because of the reason of this mystery, I now bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And verse 15 says, From whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. I'm going to read that verse again because that is my key verse. Ephesians 3 verse 15 says, From whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. That he would grant to you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the, man, in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all fullness of God. When you know that, you come to the climax of everything. And that climax is, Now to Him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. I, you know, you, you, you have to put your name in there to get excited. You, you need to say, now to him who is able to do a sea exceedingly, abundantly, above all that Paul asks. Or that Paul thinks according to the power that is at work in Paul. To him be glory in the family that Paul belongs to called the church by Christ Jesus and to all Paul's generations forever and ever. Amen. If you put your name in there, you're not going to stay quiet. <laughs> Because it's talking about you, and you are the mystery. If we get this, you're not going to need to cast out another demon. He's going to run when you announce who you are. When you step in, environments are going to shape because you are stepping in by the grace and the glory of God. You know who you are. I know who I am. I am a child of God. Your identity is secure. So when you get, yeah, I just love this, but, but what is it that we are captivated by? It's this idea of family. Verse 15, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is 
named. It is, verse 14, it doesn't say from, Paul's not saying the Lord. He's saying our Lord Jesus Christ. You can, you can put it this way. I bow my knees to the Father of my Lord. <laughs> it, it is your Lord. You see, you get all the stuff and, and you get to walk in that grace and that family because he's yours. It's my Lord. Tell somebody, my Lord. When he's my Lord, he becomes our Lord. And he is the Lord Jesus Christ. From whom the whole family. So, some people get confused because they think the whole family is all of mankind. The word there, whole, is, if you look at the Greek word, it means whomsoever. It means that whomsoever, it's a word that you need to be selective. It does not mean an umbrella covering to everyone. It means that you need to choose to be the womb so ever. It's not everyone or every person. It means womb so ever. And the womb so ever are the ones who choose to be family. We, there, there are religious groups and religious persuasions that believe that we are all children of God, but we're not all family of God. The family are the whomsoever who has chosen the Lord Jesus Christ. Who can say he is mine. He is ours. And that's the family. So whomsoever tells, just pinch somebody and say, are you whomsoever? Because you need to choose. In the Old Testament, the hanging words are, choose you today whom you will serve. It's the womb so ever. In the New Testament is all who have confessed Jesus as Lord. We have become the sons of God. It's the womb so ever. Are you the womb so ever? Oh, Lord Jesus. I'm part of the womb so ever. It's called family. And that family is an eternal family. It says, from whom the family in heaven and on earth. Oh, <laughs> the, the location of that family is beyond space and time. It is not restricted to a region, South Africa. We, our family, has its authority in heaven and on earth. I, isn't it great to be part of this family? <laughs> that there comes a time in this family when angels are subject to the family. That the devil is an angel who might be fallen, but he has to be subject. When you become the womb, so ever, every demon in heaven, in hell, and every angel in heaven understands that you are the womb, so ever, and you are part of a family that is resident in heaven and on the earth. So the struggles on the earth are insignificant because you are part of the womb, so ever. <laughs> that he would grant you according to his riches. I mean, I've never yet met a person who wants to be poor. I've never met somebody who has great wealth ask me, Charles, I really want to be poor. I mean, I would help them right away. But <laughs> <laughs> That's an easy problem to solve. I know many people who I can help, I can send their way. Um,
But if you are the whomsoever, you access the whatsoever. And the whatsoever are the riches of His glory that you access. I, and glory will beat darkness any day. It will shatter any plan of the enemy any day. If you are struggling in your family, it just means you have not tapped into His glory. If you are struggling internally with stuff, and you are trying to work it out, and you need some therapy, can I, can I tell you, therapy is good, but the Holy Spirit is better. <laughs> If you allow the Holy Spirit to, who was poured out on Pentecost to dwell in you, there is no test, no psychometric tool, psychometric tool, there's no psychological test that can measure the Spirit within you. Do you know that? <laughs> And many of you apply for jobs and they do all these tests on you. And you try and answer those tests. Lauren had some things, an interview, so she had to go through all those things um, with the Department of Education. Um, and you, you have to jump through hoops and they are measuring your soul and your behavior and your mental capacity. And, and, and sometimes they will pick up something in those tests and they won't understand it because they will say, you suffer, you, you should be having trauma and you should be showing these symptoms. We picked this up, but why are you not affected by your circumstances? How, you, you, it can't be rational. And I've learned it's not rational because it's spiritual. It is supernatural. <laughs> and when we, when, we, when we have the Spirit in us, we, we access the things that are exceedingly abundantly above what we can ask in the earth because it's according to the power that works in us. And what is that dunamis? It is Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit works in you, He brings you no longer just to power, He brings you to exousia, which is authority. And when you step in authority, you say, I'm the whomsoever. I come in the name of the Lord. So, <clears throat> the name. What name do you carry? So that, that's my message today. If I, I were to, to title this message, I will call it the name. Just the name. What's the name? And Adam... If you read Genesis chapter 2, Adam, one of his first responsibilities was to name things. <laughs> he named it. And, and, and I, I love it. Genesis 2 verse 19. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what Adam would call it, would call them, and what, here's yeah, the word again, whatever, <laughs> whomsoever Adam named, he called living creatures, that was its name. And when we read the Hebrew, that was its nature. <laughs> so Adam's Ability was to name things in the earth and he shaped the nature 
through his ability to name. That ability to name is still vested in you as Adam. You still have the capacity to name things. So you wonder why your teenager is misbehaving. Because under your breath you are naming them something else. <laughs> when they misbehave, <laughs> and nobody understands that language. <laughs> but you are so angry, and you are naming them, and you wonder why that nature becomes rebellious, because they are not being prepared. But when you call them by a name, you can shape the nature. And that was Adam's capacity. You still have it. Just imagine if we were given that as Adam, what don't we have as the new Adam in Christ? <laughs> because he has all power and all authority. And that grace is now multiplied to us. So we have the capacity to name and rename things. You are the beloved of the Lord. Names indicate identity. But that name can create a problem to the one that carries that name or to the one that hears that name. Right? So, so if you carry a name and you go into a certain place, that name would be a problem. Tamar's name is a problem. He is no longer welcome back in his own country. He would, be, he would be murdered if he went back. He's got a death sentence if he mentioned his name. That name can be a problem. So, what is the name? What is the meaning of name? So, Shakespeare had a beautiful way of putting it. So, I, can I, can I, I, I know in South Africa we're trying to get rid of Shakespeare. Um, but I, I love some of the history. Um, just listen to this. I, I should ask Ro Lauren to read this. Lauren, won't you come join me? She's an English teacher, and she is shocked that teachers don't know Shakespeare. read that part and I will read this part. It's Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> <clears throat> oh Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo? Deny thy father and refuse thy name, or if thou wilt not, be but sworn my love, and I'll no longer be a Capulet. Shall I hear more? Or shall I speak at this? Tis but thy name that is my enemy. Thou art thyself, though not a Montague. What's Montague? It is nor hand, nor foot, nor arm, nor hand, nor face, nor any other part belonging to a man. O oh, be some other name. What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name shall smell as sweet. So Romeo would... Were he not Romeo called, retain that dear perfection which he owes without that title. Romeo doth thy name, and for that name which is no part of thee, take all myself. I take thee at thy word, call me but love, and I'll be renew baptized. Henceforth, I never will be Romeo. Thank you.
<laughs> hey, Juliet. <laughs> what's, what's the story? I know some of you are like, you, 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 you gripping your seat now because you're getting that matric fear. <laughs> that exam fear, like, oh Lord, help me. <laughs> All right. We, these were our set work pieces. We had to study them. And we never did, we never did Romeo and Juliet at school, all right, but I just love the romance. And for those of you who don't know what's going on here, Romeo and Juliet is the epic love story written by Shakespeare. And we, I'm going to mess it up if you never watch Shakespeare and you never watch Romeo and Juliet. They, it's not American, all right, because they both die. <laughs> right? They don't live happily ever after. They, they, they both die, and it ends where the whole story is about two families that are, they hate each other, and they, they, they do not agree. They, they're fighting, they're, there's vicious fighting between the two families, and the two, the Juliet and Romeo, fall in love from the two different families. And they need to, they cannot help themselves. And they cannot live apart anymore. But the families will, the Montagues are, are pr prideful, they protect it, and they will not allow themselves to, to date or marry anyone. And Juliet is from the enemy. And it gets to a point where Juliet is forced to marry someone else. But before the wedding, she takes a potion, a poison, that would put her in a state of death for a period, and she would wake up. You know the story, right? Why are you looking at me like you don't know the story? <laughs> this is a church, it's not a, a movie. <laughs> and Romeo comes and his heart is broken because he thinks and believes Juliet is dead. And he comes to the grave and he at the grave of Juliet, he himself takes his life and he poisons himself because he cannot live without Juliet. Juliet's intention was Romeo would come to the grave, she would wake up and they would flee Italy together. But she wakes up and she finds Romeo dead at the graveside. And she takes his dagger and kills herself. And Romeo and Juliet, they are no more. And you're so sad. <laughs> that is Shakespeare, very deep writing. But in the essence of his writing is tremendous wisdom. Literary wisdom that he captures and it, and it, it touches on every part of humanity because it's how we fight wars and how we disagree and, and how we name things and how those names become our identity. And we defend that identity to the death and we will protect it. And here, the names, Juliet is asking Romeo, forsake thy name, Montague. What is in a name? What is a name? A rose by any other name is tall as sweet. She says, because Romeo says, I will, I will be baptized something else. And she says, but even if you change your name, you are still Romeo. And he says, I will, I will change. I will do anything for you, Juliet. And isn't that what we do? Isn't that? what happens in our city every day. People forsake 
their name and they forsake their family because of what they want. And, and, and we have religious groups who refuse for you to be married unless you change your name. In our city, in our country. And, and you can change your name, but you're still Romeo. And there are many who have changed their names, but their identity has not yet changed. They have said, I am a Christ follower, but they have not changed. And this message, which I will continue, and, and we're going to dig into how names shape and change, and we're going to go very deep into this subject. I'm, I'm just laying a foundation today. It's not even a foundation. It's the first little bit of ground leveling because we're going to build on this. That the name God gives you is a love story. He loves you. And the name He calls you you're going to hear the name that God calls you over these next few weeks. You're going to hear the word of the Lord calling you. And it's not going to be Patrick. It's not going to be Christine. It's not going to be Mama Sylvia. You're going to hear a name that God will call you. And when you hear that name, you will be prompted to respond and that response is going to make you part of the womb so ever. You're going to be counted in. You're going to be numbered amongst them. And Romeo and Juliet is a sad story. And throughout history, we have, we have kept that statement that Shakespeare penned. What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. And I want to say to you, what's in a name? And I'm going to tell you everything. Because as Adam named things, you will see how God names you. And in that name is life forevermore. The significance of names, when you name things, you start to call not only identity, you call purpose. You, you, you start to identify who that is or what that is. And... and I don't know about you, but I grew up in a time where everything had a nickname. You know, you have your real name, and then you have a nickname. I know what some of you are thinking. I know. I don't hope he knows my nickname. <laughs> I really don't hope he knows my nickname. Because you know me. I will mention that nickname from here. Um, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just silly that way. I mean, I don't think. But today I'm going to think. Um, and, but some of you have a nickname that they, were, they called you when you were younger. And your family called you, or your uncles called you, your aunts or your friends. Um, if you are brave enough, tell somebody your nickname. I, <clears throat> I know some of you said, can't remember. Yeah, that's your nickname. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
sorry, Uncle Mo- I mean Uncle Matthew. <laughs> You're not going to call Uncle Matthew, Martha, after this. Sorry. We, we, we bind you. <laughs> oh. But I have worked with enough men who had to work through issues in their lives because of what somebody named them. I worked with a guy on an executive team that would literally default to bad behavior in the board because um, he responded to a name and every time he got into a situation he would only hear that name and we're going to break that (laughs) when you hear the name God calls you it doesn't matter what anyone else calls you It doesn't matter what your husband calls you because you know what name he calls you. It doesn't matter what name the teacher calls you because you know what name he calls you. It doesn't matter what name anyone calls you, you know what God calls you. And when you know that, and some of you are going to hear it so clearly, you're going to run because of that name that's on you. So, I, I... I love it now in South Africa, we name kids like exemption because every child wants a matric exemption or university exemption. So now people are calling the kids exemption. <laughs> um, I met a guy and I've said this before at the garage, his name was Mary. I said, why did they name you Mary? And then I looked at his tag and his surname was Christmas. <laughs> Genuine, a genuine, a genuine, I, I'm not, this was true, true, <laughs> true, true, true. I, I thought it was, I thought, and eventually when I saw the look in his face, I realized, okay, it wasn't a joke, it actually is his name. All right. They should have named him like some of you, brilliant. I mean, it's just brilliant. But a name is very significant. It reflects the character. In Scripture, it reflects destiny. It reflects the role and the calling when God gives you a name. And when it, God gives you a name, it will refer to your character, to who, who He sees you to be. And there are many people in the Scripture who the Lord who really became their name, Jacob. His name meant supplanter or heel catcher. And he was really a heel catcher until the Lord had to change his name. You know, the, the names in Scripture are sometimes given by divine encounters they've had with God. And, and if you think of Abram, God changed his name to Abraham. Sarah became Sarai. And, and the names that have been changed, if we look at both Abram's and Sarah's name change, the tetragrammaton, the, the Hebrew words that were placed in their names, and I'm glad it's Pentecost, was the letters for breath or spirit. So when God puts his spirit in something, you are ready to conceive. You... you, you God gives you a name, but his name is to be in you, Emmanuel, God in you. So the, the names have prophetic significance. There's symbolism throughout Scripture. And I, I'm, I'm rushing, and we're going to come back to some of these things. Names are changed when God covenants with people. They are names that are historical. <clears throat> But I'm going to close and there's one name that God gives you and I'm going to I'm summarizing now to get to the table
that is repeated throughout Scripture. If you read Scripture from Genesis, God calls Adam. He didn't call him Adam. Adam means ruddy or red or mankind. When God said, let us make mankind, let us make Adam is the word. So Adam was description. It was not a pronoun. It was not his personal name. It was mankind. God called him Adam. But it was not his name. You, you get that? I, we, we can get confused when we say Adam and we start to think person. But when you, when you hear Adam, you must think all of us. Right? And in Adam, we all sinned and come short of the glory of God. So, but there's one name that God called Adam, and we see it in Luke, and we see it in the Old Testament. He calls Adam son. Adam, my son. And when God refers to him as son, it is his own son that God gives because God breathed into his mortal dust, his breath and his spirit. And that soul, that nephesh that was formed, was called son. All right? So God created a son, and you heard a lot about that. We are called sons, and that sonship, we became adopted in the New Testament. God chose to adopt us as sons. And we are called, uh, Galatians 3 verse 26, For you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. 1 John 3 verse 1 says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. God loves us that he gives us a name. Romans 8 puts it very clearly. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery that returns you to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship by whom we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirits that we are God's children. You are God's son. Tell somebody, son. So what stops you from walking in that identity and that name, son? So you have a name, son. And what stops you from that identity of sonship is your own fear. What stops you are the lies that you believe that you've been told. The nicknames that you've been called. And you start to believe the things and the lies that you have been told or believed, that's the untruths that shape you, and that's what stops you from responding to that name Son and walking into the authority and the grace and the glory of God as Son. Why do we have Christians who carry the name Christian who are not sons because it's a religious affair? They, they be they did some prayer and they joined some religious group, but they never, ever saw themselves as a son of God. When you start to see that God the Father is Father, He is Abba, He is Pate, He is my Father. It, I want to tell you, you, you know what I do every day? Some days when I walk to church, the other day I, uh, I walked and I walked pretty slowly um, nothing to do with age, but I just wanted to, to enjoy the time of walking here early in the morning. The sun was out. And I kept telling myself, God is your father. I'm a son of God. I'm your, and I was just saying, Lord, thank you that you are my father. Thank you that you are my father. Thank you that I am your son. No other prayer. I didn't pray for you that morning. I, I just, I was conditioning my brain 
to start to catch up with where my spirit has been. That when I walk into situations of tension, I'm going to respond, God is my father. When I, when, 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 every day there are multiple decisions that you need to make here. And, and they, they can be very difficult and, and it, you can go crazy with the number of decisions that need to be made. And I need to condition my brain that every decision must come through my father because I'm his son. When somebody phones me and says, Charles, can you do this? I need to think, God is my father. How do I respond? The king is my father. The Lord is my father. I am his son. He is majesty on high. I am his son. I am royal. I am a holy priesthood. I am responding from a name that my father calls me. So let me respond out of that name, not out of the circumstances or out of the condition, or somebody's pressure, so I can remain calm because I'm responding from heaven, because my family is seated in heaven and it rules in the earth. Oh Lord Jesus, what stops me from doing that is fear. What stops me from that conditioning are the lies that I need to jump through some hoops and so that I can be a religious bunny so I can perform certain tasks, so I can say certain prayers to come into a position where now I can get God's favor. I have God's favor because He gives me a name. Not because of what I can do for Him or what I have done to Him. I am His. He is mine. I don't believe the lies. And the games that we then play to protect ourselves. We believe that others are against us. We believe that I need to be careful of this one or that one. I need to be careful. I don't trust everyone. Don't you hear that so often from Christians? Be careful of that one. Be careful of this one. Be careful of, of, of hanging out with that one. Be careful. Be, be, I, I want to say I am not careful because I know who I am. I know who I am. I'm not living my life fearful of what's in this world. I'm not worried about what's to come or what's going to happen or in the next few days, the election and who's going to rule. I want to say that I know who's on the throne. And there's no government in the earth that can have any jurisdiction over me. Why? Because my family is from heaven. Oh, if you have the passport that's stamped by Jesus Christ, you need no other visa. <laughs> oh, Lord Jesus. Those games need to stop. We need to believe what the Father calls us, Son. God alone has the power to name us. And, and now I'm going to come to the table because it's about His name. We're going to celebrate today. And, and whenever God's about to do something. You see, Adam had the responsibility to name things. Right? But he could only name things in the natural. Whenever God is going to reorder the spiritual environment in the earth, he himself steps in and he names things. Ask Elizabeth and Zechariah when the angel appeared to them. God said, and you will name his name John. Ask Joseph and Elizabeth when the Lord appeared to them. He said, and you're going to name him Jesus. You see, when God's about to reorder things, he himself steps in and he chooses to name it. He doesn't leave it up to man. He himself names things. I, I, I trust that you are getting this because... 
The Lord says in Jeremiah 1 verse 5, He says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctify you. And I ordained you a prophet, a name, a prophet to the nations. 43 verse 1 of the same book says, But now says the Lord who created, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not. I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. <laughs> oh, when the Lord calls you, He names you, and you are His. Jesus reminds us in John chapter 10, verse 3, the sheep hear His voice and He calls His own sheep by name and leads them out. Today, I trust you are hearing your name being called. I trust you are hearing that God is calling your name. Because it's in that name that you will accomplish things. God has a name for you. And that name is so much more than what you have ever imagined. And, and, and some of you, I said, you're going to do things because there's going to be a reordering in your life. But that, those things that you need to accomplish, if they are not bigger than you, it's an indictment to who your father is. I, I want to say that again. Some of you are, are so scared to do something because it's too big for you. I want to say if it is too big for you and you're afraid to do it and you will not do it, you would rather do something that is to your ability and your capacity. You embarrass your father. Oh, somebody's not getting that. <laughs> if your dream is not bigger than you, then it's offending your father. I want to say that again to some of you. Sister Christine, if your dream to see women come <laughs> to break the shackles of poverty in Africa, if, if, if your dream is not bigger than you, then it's an offense to God. Some of you are so afraid to step into a, a place of discomfort and a place of risk. My, my, my wife challenges me all the time because I'm not afraid of risk. She won't allow me to get on two wheels. Because a taxi on four wheels has got nothing on me. <laughs> because I am not afraid. I'm not afraid. And some of you are so afraid. You're afraid of people. You're afraid of circumstances. You're afraid to do anything new. You're afraid to step out and do things. You're afraid to make a decision that is risky. I want to say, if you are afraid, you offend God. Why? Because He is the one that supplies your need. He is your Father that overshadows everything you do. And everything I do is not in my capacity to deliver. It's in His ability to love. He is Father. And when I tackle things that are bigger than me, and, and a lot of people say, Charles, you're crazy. I will never be able to do what you do. And I think... Really? I'm doing very little. When I see the things that my father has prepared, I'm only just starting. <laughs> and, and we have pastors who come here and they look at the building in progress and it's a long time and they, and they say, wow, you, you're seriously tackling a big this is a massive project. And you know, I, my head is like, I, 
I'll tell you what I'm thinking when they say that. Dude, this is small, man. <laughs> this is small. For me, it is massive. It is big. And I have no idea how I pay for the next thing. I don't know where the next load of bricks will come from. And I promise you, I don't know where the next load of wood will come from. But I do know that my Father is my provider. He is Jehovah Jireh. He has a name. He has a name. And I want to tell you that if this message of your name doesn't get to you, you're going to stay mediocre. You're going to stay employed. And you will never employ others. We need a generation of people to change this country who shift from being employed to be the employer. Oh. We need the entrepreneurs. We need the doctors and the professors who no longer study the research of others. They write new papers that shape the course of history. Oh, Lord Jesus, now tramping on holy toes. Because we have doctors in our midst. And I, and I want to challenge you. Let not thesis of your research be the boundaries of your knowledge. Let wisdom of the Spirit govern you. You will write new things. You will shape history. Oh Lord Jesus. You will find a cure to new diseases. And cancer will be that one thing I want you to solve. <laughs> I've, I've buried too many people who have succumbed to that nasty disease that in a few years will be treated like a common cold. I'm telling you that. I'm telling you that. And that research is going to come from somebody who tapped into a name. <laughs> Not from somebody who, who, who didn't know with somebody who, who, who used their own abilities, is going to come from somebody who tapped into heaven. Beloved, you are that mystery. And it's time for that mystery to be made known. It's time for you to stop limiting the name God calls you. In tobacco, it's time. It is time. Let not the circumstances of your history imprison you. Let the freedom of the Spirit break your shackles. Let it free you and know that God has a name for you. Amen.